Hello and welcome to Crimes Through Time. I'm Karen and this case is from 1946 and occurred very close to where I live in Cheshire, England. The Culvert Murder. The 3rd of January 1946 should have been a normal work day for Bernard Phillips and it certainly started out that way. Bernard was a 37-year-old father of a two-year-old son, lending manager for Refuge Lending Society, Walker Street, Manchester. That Thursday, he greeted his secretary and started his day. About 11am, a man giving his name as George Wood came to the office seeking a loan for £60. That would be about 2500 in today's money. He offered the deeds to Mossside Farm in Tarpley as surety. The address he shared with his wife, Jessie. Bernard happily agreed to the loan and arranged to meet Mr Woods at the farm on Saturday to hand over the money and collect the deeds. However, within half an hour, Mr Woods was on the phone. The loan was now a matter of urgency. He and his wife were going away for the weekend. His secretary heard Bernard say, Very well, I will be there at two o'clock. Bernard drove the company's black Ford 8 saloon car, taking the full loan amount, £40 in £1 notes and then two £5 notes, and headed for the farm. This was the last time Bernard Phillips was to be seen alive. Later that evening, when Bernard didn't arrive home, the police were notified. They quickly circulated descriptions of Bernard, the car and George Wood. The car was located that evening in a secluded part of Malton Hall Farm outside Wharton in Cheshire. On the back seat was a carton containing five eggs. No trace of Bernard was found and his briefcase was missing. Chief Constable of Cheshire Police, Sir Jack Beck, put out an appeal for information, asking the person who sold the eggs to come forward. A man called Dutton confirmed he sold the eggs from his farm at CWS in Shropshire. The police now began to piece together the car's movements on the 3rd of January. However, the biggest break in the case didn't come until Saturday the 5th, when brothers Fred and Donald Fredgold were returning from their errands. The car got stuck in the mud and they made their way along Smoky Hall Railway Bridge. By chance, Fred glanced down the embankment and spotted what looked like a body sticking out of the culvert. The culvert is a tunnel that carries the steam and an open drain under the railway. Quickly they ran to alert a nearby cottage and then to summon the police. The body was that of Bernard Phillips. Sergeant John Nixon, who was the first policeman on scene, attended with Dr Leake, who confirmed that life was extinct. The body lay just 400 yards from where the car was found, well hidden, and it was clear that the intention was for him never to be discovered. About 7.15, Dr Grace, the pathologist, examined Bernard and removed him to Winsford Mortuary, where he performed the post-mortem. All personal possessions and, of course, the loan money were missing. Hidden under the body was a commando-style knife, the murder weapon. Death was caused by hemorrhage and shock due to a large incised wound by an instrument with a sharp cutting edge, penetrating the chest wall by at least four inches. Bernard was stabbed from behind, piercing the lung through the third and fourth rib. The injury could not have been self-inflicted and he had passed away 24 hours earlier. The police began to investigate. Nixon started to hear about a local man who was spending very extravagantly given his position as a night watchman at the bacon factory. That man was Harold Berry. On the 7th of January, Nixon arrived at Harold's home address in Ledwood Street and was greeted by his wife, Jessie. He inquired about the money and she produced £22, 10 shillings from her handbag. She explained Harold had said he had collected winnings from a horse racing bet and sold some fowls. He was not at home and had been awake all weekend. Superintendent Fred Platt located Harold at the house of Irene Wynne, the young lady Harold had been having an affair with and with whom he had spent the weekend. They had taken a very lavish trip to London. When asked the, to accompany Platt to Pendleton Police Station, Harold answered, I'm not guilty, but I will accompany you. In his pockets, two pound, a cigarette lighter and a note case, the personal belongings of Bernard Phillips. 
Harold's home address was searched and a knife, overcoat and overalls were taken for further investigation. In the early hours of the 8th of January, just five days after Bernard had left his office, Harold was taken to Northwich Magistrates Court. Harold Berry, you are charged that you did, feloniously and with malice aforethought, kill one Bernard Phillips at Malton between 2pm January 3rd and 4.15pm January 5th, 1946. He entered a plea of not guilty. The trial was held at Chester Assizes on the 11th of February 1946 and took four days. The case against Harold was circumstantial, but when taken as a whole it was quite compelling. The motive was simple. Harold Berry wanted holiday money to impress Irene Wynne in London and Bernard Phillips paid the ultimate price. They were certain the plan was to rob and murder him, given the wound was from the back and there was no other injuries that were observed that could suggest that the men had fought. It can be inferred that the murder was an intentional act. Eyewitnesses testified to having seen Harold on the bus travelling to Manchester on that morning, although Bernard's secretary was unable to identify him certainly as George Wood. The prosecution's case rested on three main points. The knife. Jesse confirmed that Harold had purchased a commando-style knife for their son, however on reflection it was deemed too dangerous for him. She believed she had seen it recently in the house, but it now wasn't there. Harold had not mentioned to her that he had sold the knife, as he claimed. The possessions. How did Harold come to have Bernard's lighter and note case if he wasn't involved in the murder? The money. Harold earned £5 a week as a night watchman. But in the days after the murder, he was splashing the cash all over, giving Jesse £24, purchasing himself an expensive overcoat and then his trip to London. Harold had met Irene at the bacon factory. She was 21 years old and married to a serviceman stationed abroad. They had begun their affair just before Christmas and met two or three times a week to go drinking. Harold had asked her to go away with him to London for the weekend at the end of December and while she had been reluctant, she eventually agreed. On the 4th of January, they met and stayed with relatives of Harold. He introduced her as his wife's sister getting the train at midnight to London. He bought her flowers and books, took her to the theatre and drinks in the hotel bar. They stayed at the Euston Hotel. The next day in the market he bought a grapes costing 17 shillings and six. Now in post-war London that was really expensive, that would be about £31 in today's money, so he was really out to impress. She observed that Harold had two £5 notes, one he used to pay for a meal and the other to set the hotel bill. When they checked out to return to Cheshire on the 7th. I also observed that in researching this case, just how similar George Wood's story to Bernard was to Harold's actual situation. He needed the loan in order to go on holiday. His wife was called Jessie. Harold's boss at the bacon factory was called George Wood. Just little details that if the murderer wasn't Harold, it would make quite crazy co coincidences. When it was time for Harold to take the stand in his defence, his story was one no one had heard before. He claimed that he had met up with an old merchant navy friend, William Greenwood, on the day of the murder. William owed him £15, which was a very old debt from 1941 that hadn't been repaid. They arranged to meet at 3pm at Bostock Corner near Smoke Hall Lane, strangely close to where Bernard was discovered. They travelled together to Whitchurch to see some friends, but didn't see anybody. Harold persuaded William to stop at CWS Farm to buy some eggs for his children. Upon returning to Winsford, William produced two wallets and gave him two £5 notes from one and ten £1 notes from another, saying the extra £5 was interest. He also gave him a cigarette lighter and a note case, the items that would later become identified as Bernard's. Harold also stated he claimed the winnings from a bet placed in Middlewich, sold some fowl and withdraw £11 from a tontine club, which accounts for all the extra money that he had. Now on the surface, this story counters all the main points of evidence against him, almost too conveniently so. 
but he provided no evidence to support any part. He was challenged on the stand as to why he hadn't mentioned Greenwood before trial, or asked the police to find him, because if his story was true, likely Greenwood was the killer. All Harold said was that he was not guilty, and he knew that was the case. Harold did continue to say that while the knife at the scene was similar to the one he owned, he had sold it to a soldier in the pub in the week prior to the murder. Again, though, he couldn't offer any evidence to the identity of the soldier or where he could be found. The jury found him guilty after just 47 minutes. The judge, Mr Justice Stable, said, Harold Berry, the jury have found you guilty of the murder of Bernard Phillips. That is a right and proper verdict. I think, and you know that, you murdered and robbed him of £60. He then passed the sentence of death. An appeal was attempted, as is usual with death penalty sentences. Mr Edmund Davies KC based it on three points. One, no blood on Harold's clothing. Two, that he was in, he was not in guilty possession of Bernard's belongings, again stating that he'd been given them by the mysterious Greenwood. Three, another man was seen running from the area in which the body was discovered, but this wasn't investigated and the man wasn't identified. The Lord Chief Justice, Lord Goddard, dismissed the appeal out of hand, adding it was a perfectly useless appeal, before praising the judge's thorough summing up. Harold Berry went to the gallows at Strangeways Prison, Manchester. He was hanged by Albert Pierrepoint at 9am on the 9th of April, 1946. This case had a lasting effect. After the war, money lenders were easing the formalities of lending to help people get back on their feet and rebuild, which is how Harold was able to easily obtain the loan from Bernard. After this case, these measures were all rescinded, making it harder for many families to be able to start again in post-war Britain. Thank you for listening to this snapshot in crime history. I look forward to welcoming you back.